let's turn to the science which studies fossils, the science of paleontology. Professor Roberto Fondi is a specialist in paleontology. He teaches at the Department of Earth Sciences in the University of Siena in Italy. Amongst his other activities, he acts as scientific advisor for the reconstruction of prehistoric animals. You may be surprised to know that the fundamental assumptions upon which evolutionary thinking is based are not at all confirmed by paleontology. And what are those assumptions? Firstly, that living cells arose from non-living matter by spontaneous generation. This means that purely as a result of a chain of chemical reactions in a hypothetical primordial soup, a living cell was formed. Secondly, that these cells grouped themselves together into colonies to form complex multicellular structures. These structures were then supposed to transform during the course of time into animals and finally man. According to these assumptions, the ancestors of all living creatures, including man, can be traced back to a single cell. This ancestry is represented as a gigantic genealogical tree with numerous branches sprouting from a single trunk whose roots sink directly into non-living matter. And doesn't paleontology confirm those assumptions? Non conferma affatto questa, queste assunzioni. I vari gruppi biologici. Not at all. All the biological groups, from bacteria and blue-green algae to man, appear abruptly in the fossil record without any links connecting them with each other. Why is it then that so many people believe the fossils prove evolution? Evolution is presented to grown-ups and taught to the very young as a fact that has been verified and demonstrated for so long that it is a waste of time and even ridiculous to question it. In my books, Beyond Darwin and the Organicistic Revolution, I give the names of well-known scientists who firmly believe evolution is a proven fact, such as George Gaylord Simpson and Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard University. Yet, there are also equally well-known scientists who believe in evolution and admit uh, there is no real proof, uh, such as Emil Guyenot of the University of Geneva and G. A. Kierkart of Southampton University. So, what is the truth of the matter? Well, there is a history book of the past, and that is the rocks and the fossilized remains in them. So it is up to the paleontologist to read that book and give the answer. And what do you read in that book, Professor? In questo libro io leggo semplicemente che. The fact is that after nearly two centuries of intense research, the paleontological evidence for evolutionary theory is not only rare but highly questionable. The point is that if evolution had really happened, the evidence would be in great abundance and incontestable. The museums would be overflowing with fossils, clearly documenting the transitions between the various biological groups. Yet there are none. Moreover, there is no indication that the situation will change in the future. Those very few fossils which are claimed to show some kind of evolutionary link, such as the amphibians Ichthyostica and Simoria, the reptile Propnognathus, the bird Archaeopteryx, and the Australopithecine ape called Homo habilis, are very far from conclusive. Sono ben lungi dall'essere convincenti. And what about the supposed evolution of man? The idea of gradual evolution of man from such creatures as Australopithecine apes is totally without foundation and should be firmly rejected. Man is not the most recent link in a long chain of evolution. He represents a type or taxon which has existed without any substantial change since his first appearance. The justification for this statement is abundantly clear from my books. So what then, Professor, is your final conclusion? 
Quite simply, that more progress would be made in biology and other disciplines if they kept away from the dead-end roads of evolution mythology and resumed the fruitful approach of Aristotelian, Linnaean, Cuverian and Gothian morphology. Biochemistry is the study of the very essence and structure of life. It goes into the very heart of matter, into the nucleus of the living cell. No one these days is more qualified to talk about whether one form of living organism could have changed into another than the biochemist. Professor Sermonti, a biochemist, geneticist and molecular biologist of international repute, is just one of those scientists. So let's see what his views are on the subject of evolution. Professor, in the light of present-day molecular biology, how would you view evolution? Well, in fact, the recent discoveries of molecular biology have deeply changed our view on many problems. One of these problems is evolution. In what particular way? The results of molecular biology and genetics have shown that the main claim of evolution, namely the fact that mutations are fixed by natural selection, is not true. What natural selection does is just eliminating the novelties which the mutation can create. Natural selection has a stabilizing effect on life. But surely fossils show that animals and plants were different in the past than they are today, so they must have changed. This is not true, because it's a mistake to think that if organisms were different in the past as compared to the present organisms. The present organisms should have derived from those which, has, which have uh, disappeared. They have simply became extinct. But they have not given rise to new organisms. And this is, I would say, a general agreement. Nobody maintains that uh, mammals derive from dinosaurs. So it's obviously not the case. So this is a, a general uh, misunderstanding. The fact that in the past we observed different organisms does mean that we derive from these organisms. Evolution theory claims that some organisms, more primitive even than bacteria, have evolved over many years into man. What is your reaction, Professor, to this claim? Well, I feel this is uh, ridiculous. It's impossible. There is no way for a small organism to become man. But still more important is that what looks as a simple organism is, in fact, a very complex biological reality. Even bacteria have such uh, complex uh, genetic and biochemical make up that they cannot be derived from uh, simple forms. But does this mean that all living things have always been complex right from the beginning? Yes. This is uh, what uh, molecular biology and genetics have shown, definitely. The complexity is at the beginning. We know from our study of the cell nucleus that the apparatus